Jesus, all the places are thrilling me She owns me completely I just can't push that away Into the light Into the blue My name's Napoleon So, uh, first and foremost, thank you uh, for coming out tonight. Uh, it's going to be a great time, also very informative. You know, we're all about giving uh, a good lesson here and there, but it's got to be fun, you know, hence the musical instruments behind us. So, um, we have our first act, group, band, what's the right word? Leanne? Leanne, yeah. Leanne the band. Leanne the, Leanne the, there we go, that's their new name. <laughs> Leanne the band. Um, their first singer-songwriter from this little place called Munich, or <laughs> Munchkin? Oh, I got a reaction, okay, here we go. Um, yeah, so they're up first, and they are a wild time. So yeah, I guess just enjoy, everyone. Are people up there, too? Oh my god, I can't stop there. Okay, cool, I was wondering what that was. Hi, how's it going? Woo, music. All right, I'm gonna stop talking. Thank you for coming out. Have a great night. Have a great night. Yeah. We're yeah. going to have a great night. We're going to have a great night. We're going to have a great night. <laughs> have a great night. <laughs> All righty, folks. Alles gut, alles okay. Lass mal was hören, haben uns ewig schon nicht mehr gesehen Ich will nicht stören, aber du weißt, wenn du etwas brauchst Dann wär ich da, ein Gespräch oder was zum Rauchen Letztes Jahr um diese Zeit fahren wir noch zu zweit bei uns im Viertel Es scheint alles nicht so weit, aber in Wirklichkeit ist ein Jahr manchmal schon viel zu lang Als wir klein waren, war es nur das Sieb im Sand Und jetzt ist es die Zeit, die uns durch die Finger rinnt Wir sehen, dass die Dinge nicht für immer sind Immerhin ist manches noch beim Alten und der Sommer kommt die Bäume werden langsam wieder grün Aber auf den Straßen kennt man nicht mehr dein Gesicht Nur selten fragt der Charlie noch nach dir Und sogar der Eismann weiß schon nicht mehr, wer du bist Es ist offensichtlich, du warst viel zu lang nicht hier Okay, ich würde so gern wissen, was du tust, wohin du gehst. Ich hab begriffen, dass es dieses Mal länger braucht. Wir können warten, ein Wiedersehen reicht uns auch nächstes Jahr. Denn der Sommer war schön, auch der Herbst war okay. Der Winter ist wie der Frühling, nur mit weniger Schnee. Warum ist es noch so kalt, verdammt? Der Platz bleibt leer auf Charlies angestammter Bank. Unser Baum daneben schaut heute so trist. Die Zigarette schmeckt wie Gift. Denn auf diesen Straßen kennt man nicht mehr dein Gesicht Nur selten fragt der Charlie noch nach dir Und sogar der Eismann weiß schon nicht mehr, wer du bist Es ist offensichtlich, du warst viel zu lang nicht hier
enjoy the performance thus far? Uh, Ian Sam, since many people might not exact exactly know what lupus and IBD drones and colitis even are, um, could you tell us a bit about the diseases, how they affect people and also how you both personally are connected to the causes? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and I'm going to call it from now colitis ulcerosa, because oh, that right. sounds so much nicer than <laughs> ulcerated colitis. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so uh, inflammatory bowel disease so, is two main diseases, and that's Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis, um, and that affects the digestive system. So with Crohn's disease, that can be anywhere from the mouth all the way through. Um, with ulcerative colitis, it's just in the colon. Um, I was diagnosed with ulcerative colitis in 2004. Uh, when I was 20-something. <laughs> and <laughs> and um, it, was, it was a massive shock. It was something that I had never heard of before. Um, I was basically, I collapsed at home. I ended up being blue-lighted into hospital. Um, had some tests and they said, this is what you've got. Uh, they sent me away with a prescription and that was it. And I had no idea. Um, and that's when I found Crohn's and Colitis UK, who just gives so much information and support. Um, and then in 2013, I got really, really ill, and I had to have a surgery to remove my large intestine. Um, and that's when I got my uh, ostomy bag. Um, and I started to blog, I started talking about it because there was so much shame and taboo. Um, so my blog's called So Badass, uh, and it's because it's for all the badasses with badasses. Um, oh, badass. I, I, badass. The first time you said it, I feel bad. I just kind of nodded. I didn't actually, it was the accent. So badass. That's so badass. I was waiting for a reaction from you like that. Oh. I thought you said sober ass for a second. Oh, I'm and then you said not about the best. GNT. Yeah, okay, cool. Like, oh no, she's falling away. Yeah. So badass. So badass. That's yeah. awesome. Okay, yeah. cool. I started blogging about it and talking about uh, my journey with this illness because you know we don't like to talk about toilet issues. Um, it's not something that's really done in polite company, um, apart from me. Uh, <laughs> people call me the poo lady. Uh, I mean, not just like people in the street. <laughs> like people aren't bullying me. It's fine. Um, so yeah, I talk about it all the time. I talk about it for Crohn's and Colitis UK. I'm one of their um, champions, so I do a lot of talking about the amazing work that they do, and that's to do with support, uh, raising awareness, and research, because there's currently no cure. I went on a bit, didn't I? What? No, that's great. I could talk about poo all night. <laughs> yeah. How long have we got? <laughs> but it's, it's such an education for me, because I, I know very little about it, um, and, and I, but I've just recently started following uh, Crohn's and Colitis UK, and seeing on, on and following them on Instagram, and seeing so many people post with images of the bags and, and trying to actively destroy the taboo and shame and things that, to me, it would seem like it would exacerbate or make the problem worse. You know, sometimes when, at least with lupus, which I guess, how about I get into that first? Um, my name's Ian Harding. I work a lot with uh, the Lupus Foundation of America. Uh, and lupus is an autoimmune disease. Um, and when people hear autoimmune, uh, they think a lot of times of HIV or AIDS. And it is different in that um, HIV is an underactive immune system, whereas lupus is an overact <clears throat> overactive immune system. So for instance, my mom, who is the reason I've uh, been involved, she's had lupus for roughly 26 years. and which is amazing in that when she was diagnosed when I was a child, because I'm also 30, <laughs> um, I, I, you know, I didn't really know what it was, um, and she was very good at sort of hiding what it meant um, and some of the symptoms, and the doctor told her she had eight years to live, wow. and yeah, so she should get all of her things in order because she would probably not see my high school graduation. So um, 
that obviously came and went because I had graduated from high school, shockingly. <laughs> um, and um, and so yeah, that's how I've been involved. I think that when you get any sort of platform, which for me was a television show that somebody was stupid enough to hire me for, um, you know, I felt this need to like kind of give back and do something um, important, which was raise awareness. Um, of which I sort of discovered while being abroad here that there doesn't seem to be a lot of um, organizations. I mean, maybe there is, and I don't mean to. Maybe organizations, but not. A, I wouldn't say as a much lot awareness. of awareness raising. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's very limited, so this is why we're doing this tonight. Yeah, that's why we're here. So. Oh, yeah. And I think social media has changed everything. It's right. stopping things having to come from a, a massive organization, right. and just everyday people can talk about their, right. their illness, they can talk about what they're going through. And it also connects people. And they absolutely. Connect. absolutely, absolutely. I knew nobody with this, and now I've, I think, you know, people do get in touch with me. <laughs> and yeah. tell me everything, right. <laughs> <laughs> which yes. I love, I absolutely yeah. love. Um, but yeah, it definitely, it, it links people together because I think, um, so Crohn's and clients are both autoimmune diseases mm -hmm. as well, um, and you can feel so isolated when you, you get that diagnosis, and it's frightening, mm -hmm. and just being mm -hmm. able to talk to somebody else who can say, right. yeah, I know, it, yeah. it means the world. Yeah. Absolutely. Yes, uh, you mentioned already you came in the path of um, Crohn's and Clients UK with the Foundation of America. Mm -hmm. Could you tell us a bit about the agendas that the um, organizations have? Like, is it purely medical or yeah. what do they do? They, uh, they for, for me, the Lupus Foundation of America does, uh, it does, the LFA does it all kind of thing where, yes, it is awareness raising and you know, especially with sort of high-profile people being diagnosed with lupus recently, like Selena Gomez and Nick Cannon, um, it's becoming more and more known. Um, so of course they can throw these big kind of blowout things and people can come and, and meet with doctors and, and look at symptoms and, and sometimes, like simple things like a rash. The people thought, oh, every once in a while I'll get really tired, I'll get this rash that won't go away and I think it's a skin issue and it's not. Um, so they do that, but also, um, with the money, I think sometimes when it comes to certain charity work, when people say, oh, we're raising money for awareness, that could be a very, a very vague thing, you know? Um, and sometimes you don't know where that money goes. And I know that with right. the LFA, the money goes to the doctors and scientists, because I've met them. I've like been face to face with them, and I'm like, you know, level with me. D does the LFA do that? I'm like, oh, yes, absolutely. The money comes directly our way. I've um, just realized yeah. you're saying LFA and not elephant. Elephant is <laughs> the accent. I really I think, think you want it's the elephant do it. The elephants do a lot. That's what you thought I was here for actually like, you know, an anti everything. Um yeah, so um yeah, so but then on top of that, they lobby Congress. So at some point I'm hoping, I think per perhaps in March. I'm actually going to go to DC and, and speak with Congress uh, men and women to try and uh, help get more research and you can get grants and government bonds to discover, you know, to give to scientists and doctors that will do the real work. And that's kind of my job is to show up, raise money, be an idiot. And, like, <laughs> and people are like, talk oh, about elephants. Talk about elephants. <laughs> it's like the elephants are going to help. Um, so, yeah, that's, I hopefully that answered. Your question yes. and other people's questions. And it's also for Crohn's and Clients UK, um, it's focused on research and awareness raising, basically. Yeah, yeah, so part of it is about creating an understanding of what Crohn's and Clients right. is. Um, and they do that through lots of community work, lots of events. Um, each uh, area in the UK has a network, so I volunteer for my local network. Um, and that's sort of connecting with people on a one-to-one -one basis. Uh, their website is just packed full of amazing information and support, um, and also funding just really vital research. Um, they're also uh, campaigning for faster and better diagnosis, right. um, because it's something that's taken people so long right. to get a diagnosis. Um, and yeah, so it's, it's, they, they just do an amazing job. And, you know, 
I know I'm here to, to talk about them, but I, I, I genuinely adore what they do. They, they care so much. I went to Parliament a couple of years ago and I got to speak to MPs and peers. Um, you know, it's not about uh, just getting their CEO to go and talk to people. They want patients to be out there and talking about it. Uh, and that was just a massive honour. Right, right. That's what I think is so amazing, that there's so much going on. Yeah. And you guys have walks every now and then, yeah. galas, all that sort of stuff. And uh, it brings people together and helps uh, with the fundraising. So that's uh, really great, I think. Um, a question that people might ask themselves is, um, can I even make a change with my fundraising? Can I make a change with my donations? Like, um, would you say that starting something yourself, even if the, the, the range of people that you reach isn't that big in the beginning, can actually make a change? Would you encourage people to just get out there themselves and do something? It doesn't have to be, doesn't have to be as a part of an organization, you can just do it yourself. Yeah. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, we, we have a really small volunteer team where we are and we do small events in little pubs and we're raising money and this this sounds like such a small thing but we're raising money to buy fans like proper great fans for all of the wards because when you're in hospital and you've had surgery and you're feeling terrible just having something like that and ice machines and you know, just these things that you know it's not about sort of having a grand gala and and doing I mean that that's great, but just as a as an individual, you can make such a massive difference. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I, I mean, for for any organization, obviously, we're here for the LFA and for Crohn's mm -hmm. Glides, the elephant. We're here. For the <laughs> I'm so sorry. No, that's right. I guarantee the Lupus Foundation is going to be like, you called us elephants. <laughs> you make fun of us in Germany. Um, yeah. No, but uh, the Lupus Foundation and Crohn's Glides UK. Um, you know, oh god, where was I going with this? I'm, I'm distracted <laughs> with the average rate. I, I think... Are you distracted by the elephant yes, in the room? Yes, distracted by the elephant in the room. There's another pun. So um, I think we're here for those, these organizations, but if you have something that affects your life and is very important to you, there are ways of going and doing it. And even if you raise a hundred bucks, if it's for the right organization, which you can research on, on sites like Charity Navigator and GiveWell.com, I think, it's the right one. Um, it can do a lot because so many of these organizations um, give money directly to the people who are sort of on the front lines, whether those are doctors, whether those are politicians. Um, I know those are, that's everybody's favorite thing right now is politicians. But, um, you know, you can make a difference. And for me, the biggest thing was, um, yes, it's good to raise money, and you know, I'm happy that my mom was like, good job, son. But I met somebody a little while ago, it was one person who has ever said this to me. And she said, I felt ill for a while, and I didn't know what it was. And then I stumbled upon like my Instagram or something like that. And I saw a post that I did about lupus. And she said, and then I went to a rheumatologist and I got it checked out, and I have lupus. And I don't think I would have done that if I hadn't seen this one post. And so if you affect one person, as the cliche goes, if you affect one person, then you've made a difference. So you don't need to like cure the disease, although obviously we're hoping that happens, but it's just the one person. I guess that's what I'm trying to say. So yeah, fundraise in your neighborhood, have, you know, Conventions and pubs, which sounds fantastic. You are welcome. I don't know why we're doing walks and everything. Let's just meet in a bar. <laughs> you know? yeah. And like I say, it's, it, even if it's not about fundraising, just just speaking out. If you've got something that's affecting you, it's, it can be so isolating. And just being brave enough to speak about it can make people feel so much better. I get so many messages from people saying just that. Just they've seen one picture, they've read one post. And it make them feel a little bit less alone, and, and that's an amazing feeling. Right, right. right. I was just gonna um, ask this next. Like, you've both been fundraising and raising awareness for years now. Um, if there have been any uh, memorable moments in your um, advocacy years that you that show you that the hard work is really paying off, like that's where you just should obviously that 
Um, has it happened for you too that at some point you were just like, okay, I really made a difference now and it's not in terms of money, but also personally? Yeah, I, you know, there's, there's a lot of big things. It's, it's really nice to get to go on TV and it's really nice to talk on the radio. It's amazing to come to events like this. But uh, again, it's not that individual thing. So I got an email from somebody saying that since they had their ostomy bag, they hadn't left the house and they said their home had become a prison to them. Um, and seeing the images that I'd put out had just made them feel brave enough to to go out and to speak to people, and it, that that changed everything for me. It, it went from my blogging being something really just about me diarising what was, I was going through, and it made me realise that every individual person can make a difference, and it was it was a real life changer for me. Right, right. Um. One thing that I wanted to talk with you about is um, you, you, you once started a campaign called More Than Meets the Eye. Would you mind telling us a bit about it? Yeah, so I wrote a post about accessible toilets. Um, and I t honestly, you're laughing. I talk about poo all the time. Yes. <laughs> um, and it was about how, uh, as somebody who looks like a non-disabled person, using an accessible toilet, um, it was about the, the dirty looks that you get, the, the comments, the, the nasty comments. Um, and that sort of went a bit viral. Um, and I started getting a lot of messages back and it, it was, there was from so many people with these invisible impairments. So I got messages from people with Tourette's who say that they have uh, quite violent tics and they need to use a, a bigger cubicle or they injure themselves. Uh, people uh, with partners with dementia who can't go into a bathroom on their own. Uh, there were so many people, people who've got cancer, people with ostomy bags, people with your ostomy bags. Um, and I thought, right, I've got to do something with this now. If, you can, if you've got a voice, then, then use it to shout as loud as you can. Um, so I started this campaign, which is more than meets the eye, and it was just about raising awareness of invisible impairments and people recognising that uh, disability is not just being a wheelchair user, it can be so much more and that you can't tell that by looking at people. Right, and it might be a bit of a issue here, um, like you don't yeah. look ill, what's that even about? Like, yeah. I don't have to justify myself uh, from an illness. That's Absolutely. And I think when you're at your lowest, you know, when you've left hospital and you, you just need, it, it, I think people don't realise that it's taken everything you've right. got to get out of the house that day to manage to have a shower and then you go out and you need to empty your ostomy bag and then you have to face people giving you looks or, or commenting to you, you know, what are you using this for? Right. Um, and it's soul destroying, you know, you just think, why have I bothered? Why did I bother coming out today? Because this was the hard, this was my climbing Mount Everest, just coming to the supermarket today. Right, right, right. Um, and just making people aware that, you know, you, you can't see what people are going through. Everyone's going through their own struggles and everything I do in my blogging is about kindness. We all just need to be kinder people and we don't uh, recognise and support Kindness. Nobody ever goes, you know, when you see people on TV, they're not talking about the kindest person in their office or, you know, it's all about money and, and stature and that's rubbish because nobody actually cares about those things. Nobody says that they're friends with their best friend because of how much money they've got in the bank or how powerful they are. You're friends with people and the people you want to be around uh, because they're kind and nice and I just think we all need to be so much kinder and people think that that's a weakness yeah. they think that i i sort of i'm a weak person for talking so much about kindness and i think it's so much easier to be nasty especially with social media now you know the amount of, of comments that people just throw out there on twitter it's easy to just say something nasty sometimes it's a little bit harder to take things in and think about it and think about how would you want somebody to be speaking to your partner or your friend um, so yeah, the, the more than meets the eye, it was about raising awareness, but it was also just about talking about kindness and kindness to others. Right. Awesome. Yeah, that was great. Uh, can, can we yeah. actually clap? Yeah. 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 I have nothing to add to that. That was so oh, great. Right. Thank yeah. you. Uh, like, now for question time, right? Yeah, that's about it. <laughs> 
the extent of my German right there. Yeah, frog, all right. That, wait, was that right? Is, is that, that what you said, actually? Uh, okay. Right in, yeah. <laughs> cool, cool. Anyone? There's one. Feel free to ask it yeah. uh, in German as well. <laughs> Um, have there been any like milestones that the foundations um, like had, like any breakthroughs? Is there something inside like could they actually solve it? And uh... yeah, I I had a um, I had a couple conversations. One was with um, a leading doctor whose sadly name, of course, I'm forgetting, but I'm also an idiot. But uh, <laughs> that basically said, you know, we feel like we're in. I'm gonna make like a sports reference, but it feels like we're in the ballpark, but the lights aren't on. So like we know we're in the right place, but we just can't find the exact solution. So where we're starting to see more of that come true is with the medication that people take for lupus. And for a while, the, the worst part about the disease was not the disease itself, it's what happened from the medication that you took. Um, and one of the things I'm very proud of with the Lupus Foundation is that they work with a lot of um, pharmaceutical companies to start to like minimize the effects, and so now lupus medications are not as hard on the system. They're still not great because it's you know for a while chemo was used, um, prednisone, which is a steroid to those who don't know, can really take a toll on the system. Uh, there's a leading uh, pill called Celsep, which is works for some people and really doesn't work for other people. Uh, my mom can't take it anymore because she was just having horrible uh, flares from it. Um, so we have started to see that changes have been made. Just in, in the time that I've been working with the Loops Foundation, which is, I don't know, five, six years, that medications have become, you don't have to take them as frequently and, and they're, har they're less harsh on the system. So that was one thing that I, that I noticed. Um, how does lupus affect people? What's like? How does it show? Yeah, that's uh, that's one of the sort of tricky things about the disease because it shows in many different ways. Um, for my mother, it sort of manifests in um, her joints, and she'll be very sort of. Uh, achy and tired. A lot of people can feel just exhausted even though they've just slept for nine hours. Um, for other people, it, it will affect the organs and that's when it can start to get a little bit more dangerous. Um, and occasionally it can kind of trick your body into thinking that something is happening when it's not. For instance, my mom on Christmas Eve actually, um, we thought she was having a heart attack and we go to the hospital, and my mother was a cardiac nurse for years, and she, she knows it's, she knew it wasn't a heart attack, but her body was telling she was having all the symptoms and everything. And we go to the hospital, and they investigate, and it was just part of a lupus flare. And I imagine it's really frustrating for people who have lupus to have a doctor, this person who's supposed to know what's happening, look you in the face and go. <laughs> You know, and that's the reaction, but that sadly happens. So, you know, I, hopefully this answers your question, but I'm guessing it probably gives you more questions. Um, so sorry about that. Great. Yeah, did it? And what was your first reaction when your mom told you that she was ill? You know, my first reaction was, um, I was, I was young, and so I think at first I was very dramatic, and I, I cried. Because I just thought, like, oh, this is it. She's she's done for. And then you know, and then I slowly got past it. And it wasn't it wasn't until later in life that I realized the severity of it. When I met multiple people, actually, there's I was in college. And it was my first day. It was right after orientation, and I was wearing a purple uh, bracelet because uh, one of the colors of lupus and of the foundation is is, is purple. Um, as well, right? Yeah, isn't that interesting? Is it like the autoimmune? 
I, I guess so. I'm sure I there's noticed, a history there. I work for Scope as well, and they're a disability charity, and we're purple. So. Really? And they call it the purple pound, don't they? The yeah. like disability, disabled really? people's money. I, I wonder, there's got to be some history there. There has. Um, we should know the answer. But, yeah, we should. <laughs> Especially if we get up here like, let me tell you about Lopez. Um, <laughs> I don't know, know nothing about it, um, but this one, this one uh, classmate of mine, he he noticed the bracelet. He said, "Oh, is that for the Lupus Foundation?" And he said, "Yeah, it is. It's a wonderful bracelet." Like an idiot. And he <laughs> said, "Who do you know that has lupus?" I said, "Oh, my mom does. Do you know anybody?" And and he said, um, "Yeah, my mom had it. Past tense." <laughs> and so, yeah, I. Oh God, where was I going with that? What was the question? I'm so sorry. <laughs> like, I realized like, I just had a moment there thinking of that whole interaction. But, um, yeah. Did that answer your question? <laughs> okay, okay, cool. Sorry. Yeah. Following on from that, so I've got three children, three teenagers, mm -hmm. and it worries me how my illness has affected them and how it will affect them. You know, they've had to see me in hospital so many times. Uh, there's, they, there's times where I just can't do anything, where they come and see me in bed. Um, so how do you think having a parent with mm -hmm. a, an illness like this, how do you think it's affected you as a person? Hopefully it's made me more empathetic. And I think, um, yeah, I, I mean, I have questions for you in that sense too, as, as, as a parent, because, you know, my, my mom would always say, like, I just felt, I just felt weak. But weak, I mean, apart from feeling actually weak, like she can move. She said, you know, you want to be that strong person for your kids. And sometimes you can, and sometimes I've been the person that is the one that like helps her, you know, we haven't had too many cases like that, but where you as the child become the parent. Yeah. And, and I think a lot of, um, for kids at least, shockingly, I think it's a good thing. I think that kids and parents are a lot stronger um, than you, than we think. We think, oh, if I'm not just this Iron Man for my children, they're going to be horrible people or something. Mm -hmm. And but I think it is that kindness, and perhaps going off what you were saying earlier, that vulnerability that actually makes your relationship better with your kids. Again, this is me talking as somebody who owns two dogs, but like <laughs> you know, it's not the same. But I not only I think cultivated a sense of empathy. But I saw what real strength was, that in the light of, you know, a lot of pain and suffering and absurdity, you know, she's having a, a fake heart attack on Christmas Eve, I saw, I saw what real strength was, that she still, at the end of the day, was like, you know, putting the roast in, you know, was kind of come angry about the fact she was like, oh, I burned this, you know, <laughs> like it's still, that's, I think that's, for me, you think it's going to be bad, and, and it's not. It actually helps in the end. Is that's what nice. I was getting at. That's nice. Dude. I think. Yeah. That happened for me. I mean. I think that it, I, I completely agree with you. I think that for so long I was so frightened, and I really wanted to hide it from them so that they didn't have to suffer. Um, and when it got to the point where I couldn't hide it anymore, actually, it's made us so much closer. Um, we have a really open and honest relationship and I think in seeing me open up and show my vulnerability they are happier to show me their vulnerability and come to me when they need something and, and that means a lot yeah. um, but it is hard sometimes you know when you're in bed and you know Crohn's and colitis have a similar thing with the extreme fatigue so there's times where I just can't get up and they'll come and bring me a cup of tea and a hot water bottle and, and they're teenagers now but they'll just come and bring the laptops and, and watch YouTube videos next to me and, and that's really nice and you know yes sometimes I would like to be the parent who is taking them to a theme park or doing these things I can't always do that and actually we just find ways around it uh, but it's still it is frightening you know you want to be everything for your children and when you can't do that, it does worry me how, how will it affect them in the future. But currently, they're, they're, doing, they're doing all right. It, and actually, I, I think it, it can also cultivate, 
you have to have humor about things. Oh, I mean, especially yeah, right, right, you're sitting here talking about like you know you're the uh, you're the poo lady, <laughs> and, and my mom is often told you know she's um, she's a bit older again. Not going to give away her age, but she looks great for her age. And people come up to her and she'll occasionally do this. And like we're like, wow, your skin is so youthful and so like how, what is your secret? Her secret is that because she has because she's uh, photosensitive to sunlight. She has to lab it like SPF a thousand, you know, just <laughs> on her body. And she's really in the sun. She has these gigantic hats that, you know, prevent any sunlight. So, you know, she looks like the sexiest vampire you've ever seen. <laughs> and so people will say to her, you know, like, what is your secret? And she's like, lupus. <laughs> and then they kind of go, what is that? You know, she has to explain it. And then it gets uncomfortable. But like, I think you have to like have humor in that sense oh, too. Oh, you definitely do, and it, it gets dark sometimes. That oh, dark yeah. humor is the best. I usually bring my children to things like this when I do talks, um, and we were in Edinburgh doing a talk, and yeah. uh, before we went on, the, the host was saying, yeah, and then we'll go to the audience and ask questions, and I could see them all giggling. I said, what are you laughing at? And they said, um, we're going to ask a question. I was like, well, what are you going to ask? And I've got three children, and they said, we're going to ask, which one of us is your favourite? Yes! <laughs> and you'll have to tell the truth, because you're on stage with a microphone. So, yeah. I think, luckily, my husband just got to take them out. <laughs> yes. Amazing. I think, you know, right, are there other questions? Oh, yeah. <laughs> it's like two in the morning, we're still... Um, how, do you, how do you get the, the, the genetic or for some kind of virus or something completely different? Yeah, uh, uh, both, both uh, lupus and, and Crohn's? Or, um, yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. they, they don't really know. Yeah. That's, again, another thing that's horrible. It could be horrible, genetic, but... but it's not 100% sure. Yeah, There's, um, they don't really know, which is... The, which makes it uh, even trickier. You know, just give the crap out of everybody. <laughs> like, hopefully, we're <laughs> encouraging the hope and everything that if, if this part, if this thing does befall anybody in this room, it's not, you know, it isn't the end of the world, but it's something that you get to grow with and struggle against, and I think, you know, become a better person because of. But, yeah. Yeah. Not to, so, did I interrupt you? I think yeah, I'm, no. Okay, okay. Yeah, you know, she, she's good right now. She recently retired because she realized, she, you know, she's been a nurse for uh, 40 something years. Um, and I think she had enough doctors tell her, you have an immunosuppressant or a disease that suppresses your immune system and you're working in a hospital. Probably not the best idea. <laughs> you know, I think it's time to like, call it quits. And, um, She's doing well. Uh, I think with the disease, you just learn to save her life a little bit more. You know, like she's just really excited about the bulbs of tulips that she's gonna plant in the ground. She tells them, tells me all about it. Poor mom, mom, I love I, I don't care anymore. <laughs> like it's just, it's, there's so many bulbs that you can plant. Um, but then, you know, and then it will switch. And then she'll be in a really bad place for a while. And you just kind of, Learn to take the ups and downs. So, right now, right now, she's good. Thank you for that question. There's a there's a thing called the spoon theory. Have you heard of the spoon theory? Have No. I'll what? teach you. Okay. So, um, people with chronic illness are often called spoonies. So, have you seen this like hashtag spoonie? So, the spoon theory is that uh, it's about I can't remember who came up with it, but if you Google it, you'll find her. Um, and it was somebody trying to explain to a friend about chronic illness and about the levels of fatigue. So she, they were sat in a, in a cafe and she gave her five spoons. And she said, every time you use energy, I'm going to take one of the spoons away. So explain your morning to me. So it's like, well, I got up. Well, hang on a minute. Did you sleep last night? How well did you sleep? How, is it, how long is it going to take you to get up? Give me a spoon. She's like, okay, I'm going to have a shower. She's like, well, are you going to wash your hair? Because that takes two spoons, or are you just going to shower? And she's like, okay, I'll just shower. Okay, that's one spoon. Okay, 
are you working today? And so she went through the day and it was just this way of explaining that when you have a chronic illness that uh, includes fatigue, you only have a limited number of spoons per day. And so sometimes you really have to save your spoons. So that would be, sometimes it would be, I've got to go and take the kids to school. I don't have enough energy to do that and take a shower this morning. Or I don't have enough spoons to wear uh, shoes that I need to bend down and lace up. So I'm going to wear flip flops today. So it's this way of explaining that there's only a limited number of spoons or a limited amount of energy that you have per day. And so sometimes you have, things have to slip. You can't do everything. And if you use all of your spoons, and if you use extra spoons from tomorrow, then tomorrow you're only going to have two spoons and you're going to spend the day in bed. So it's just a really nice way to try to explain that feeling of, of absolute fatigue. And it's, it's yeah, I think, I think it works really well. Uh, what restaurant was she in that she could get this much cutlery <laughs> to explain this theory? Yeah. Wow, okay, good to know. Great. Um, There's yeah. more than one. Um, how much progress has been made in terms of medication or life expectancy since your mother was diagnosed? I mean, is it still so, like, five years to live, or has the medication come far enough? I think the medication has. Um, you know, I, I think if there were a true medical professional sitting on this stage that could give you a, a far more detailed answer. Clearly my mom has um, lived far past uh, her expected eight years. Um, I think it sometimes depends on how the disease affects your body. Some people get, you know, you never want to say some people get lucky, but uh, some people it really affects their joints and they just feel you know, someone older than they actually are, and they're just kind of stiff, and so, okay, so they can't play sports as much as they used to. Um, and so the medication that they're on allows, gives them a bit of energy or, or something like that, but I, I think it kind of varies case by case, um, which is both good and bad. I, I, but I think on the whole, it has progressed slightly. Yeah. Oh, there's a... Uh, oh no, never mind. That was from the booth. I just gave away an industry secret that she was flagged down by the phone. Okay. Is there hey. another, uh, I think we have. I think we have time for one more. One more, yeah. That is, I think, a question that is above my pay grade. Um, <laughs> I, I, you know, I know actually. Um, one of my friends. Uh, has it that's uh, and she I think it I think it depends um, I think it can affect fertility I don't think it's a definite like yes and no like if you're taking this you will not have kids or should not have kids um, I know she does uh, a chemo drip the same thing as obviously cancer patients and everything and I know that can affect fertility but um, I think it really depends but again thankfully to harken back to the the previous question. I think progress has been made. Hopefully. Again, I, I, I make believe for a living. So like what do, what do I know? But yeah. I think that it what you meant is that sometimes it can be dangerous to have children while you're on medication in terms of it being disabled or something like that. So that's something you might have to watch out for. But in in general it is possible to start a family when on medication. You just gotta check what kind of medication you're taking, but it's not um, impossible. Okay, I know this is like... Uh, my question is that, um, do you realize any difference uh, about things you might have to do pain or anything? Like, uh, more yes, if your diet changes your symptoms. I think people are very, very different in general, and so that I, I will always say in general because some people won't find this, in general having a lot of uh, hard to digest vegetables is quite difficult. So I don't have any large intestine now, so I, my, my uh, digestion ends at the end of my small intestine. And so there are definitely things where I struggle if I eat them, uh, but I'm also quite greedy and so sometimes I just, I just go for it, I go for that peanut bar, even though I know it's not going to be great. Um, 
Uh, but yeah, in general, it's about um, there was really hard to digest vegetables, fruits and vegetables that for people with a full digestive system tend to be good for you. Uh, it often tends to be the other way around. And a lot of people tell me that they find that when they're in a flare up, having junk food, so you know, the takeaways and the fries and the burgers, is actually a lot easier on the system. Uh, and I think that's because, you know, it's processed crap. Um, and so it's, it's your, your body digests it all really easily. Um, but it's, it's so difficult, and I get a lot of questions about diet, and it's really hard to answer because people are so different. Some people go on a totally vegan diet and they are fine with it. Other people, if they even look at a carrot, they know that they're in for a flare up. So it, it, it's quite hard to answer that question. For me, I, I, I know my body quite well now. I know when I can handle things, and there are occasions where I will go on a bit of a liquid diet. Uh, not, not gin, you know. <laughs> well, sometimes gin. But yeah, there's, there's just certainly times where I know I've got a very sensitive stomach, and so I'd go on some soups and things like that. Uh, but I think one of the things uh, about any chronic illness, any long-term illness where you're not going to get better, is you learn how to manage it yourself. Um, and that's really important to get your independence back. When I, when I first got diagnosed, I whenever before I'd been ill, you, you, you told you, well, like, you go to the doctors, they give you some medication, they say, take this for a week and then you'll be fine. Um, and it was such a massive learning curve to have to learn how to take so many different medications and to, to really start to listen to my body. I think before that point, um, I wasn't very in tune with my own body um, because I don't think we're really taught to be in tune with our bodies. And when something goes wrong, it becomes really important to, to listen to your body, to, to learn what is good for you, what doesn't work for you, to learn uh, when you can exercise, when you can't exercise, because really it's about getting some control back. When you have an illness that literally you lose control of your bowels, control becomes quite important in the rest of your life. Um, and at first I found that like a really negative thing, um, but now it's just made me feel, like I say, like I'm definitely more in touch with my own body. Um, and I think when you have to deal with uh, an ostomy bag every day, um, you certainly become less squeamish about your own body. You and I've definitely become a lot more accepting of it. Be before I had the bag, you know, I, I'm a woman, so I've been brought up around media that told me I've never ever good enough and that, you know, you're too fat or you're too thin. Um, and when I got my bag, so many people really assumed that it would, you know, devastate me and actually it did the opposite it made me feel like man I'm strong I've been through this terrible massive operation I spent days in an intensive care unit and now I'm just standing around walking around and I haven't got a massive part of my, my organs and so it made me feel like a bit of a superhero um, which is I don't know whether that's a, something that other people have found, but it definitely made me think, actually, screw all of that. Screw all the worrying about how big my arse is and, and whether I should be dieting and whether I should be looking like that woman or that woman. I'm me and I'm here and, and I'm pretty awesome. <laughs> Thank you so much for being here tonight. Thank you. 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 Get it started. Yeah. And we will lead the stage. I should not sing with her. So that'll be bad. Thank you again. Thank you. Shell down, you don't. Want
Splashing Hill. Uh, so if we could get a raucous round of applause for that, that would be good. Uh, so no, this is a wonderful band. They've been together for 10 years. Wow. Was that since uh, University of Everything? And uh, one of the many special things about this group is that the uh, pianist is the one and only Suzanne Augustine, who was sitting with us on the stage and sort of got this whole thing together, so let's get a round of applause for her, sort of specifically. <laughs> I think without further ado, we give you Splashing Hill.
gorgeous hollow places are thrilling me She owns me completely I just can't push that away Santiago, the campo is the place I tried to get myself for weeks So stay away with your fingertips There is lust on both sides Now it's our 